Well, we are continuing this series called DNA, and uh, what we've been doing here at Colonial for the last few weeks together is we start this series called DNA, and it's a study of looking at what makes Colonial, Colonial, or maybe I should say what makes the church, the church, and what makes us as individuals, uh, Christ followers, what are unique characteristics that, that should be in us as Christ followers, and you know, each one of us have a DNA, uh, biologically speaking, in your own body. You have DNA. This is the reason why you're bald. This is the reason why you have a great head of hair that most of us are jealous of. This is the reason why you have maybe brown eyes or blue eyes, uh, the way that you are maybe you're an introvert or an extrovert. All this is found in your genetic coding of your DNA. And sometimes we can take the mirror and look in the mirror and say, man, I, I don't like my DNA. I wish it was a little bit different. Um, and sometimes when it comes to churches, I believe churches have DNA. Uh, we, 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 we exist as a family of believers, and sometimes our DNA is good. Sometimes it's actually bad. Sometimes we lift up the mirror and we look in it as a church and go, eh, I don't know if that seems right. I don't know if that looks right. And so what we've been doing is looking at Scripture and saying, what do we find in Scripture that is a part of the DNA of a Christ follower, part of the DNA of of a local body of believers that we call the church here at Colonial. Some of them may just be um, aspects to say, man, we need to grow in this. We, 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 we need to kind of press into this a little bit more. Some of them may be there. You be the judge, right? Um, but we're kind of leaning into this to say, God, show us what does it look like to be a biblically functioning community? What does it look like for us to have impact in the city in which we live? Every man, woman, and child will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And what does that mean for me individually? So we began our study together looking at Philippians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That this idea that we, part of the DNA of a Christ follower, is that we own the responsibility of our own spiritual walk. We have to own our spiritual growth. This can't be something a pastor does. This can't be uh, a responsibility of a small group leader or your spouse. This can't be the responsibility of Pastor Mike over in student ministries. If you're a student, your responsibility to grow spiritually, it's all up to you. Now, when I say it's all up to you, it's your energy and it's your effort. As a church family, we come, and sl- we come alongside, we encourage, we give you opportunities to grow. But at the end of the day, we have to own this. And Paul said to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He wasn't saying work out your justification or your salvation. He wasn't saying earn your salvation. He was saying to grow spiritually, you got to work at it. That there is a fear and trembling. It's the all aspect of our faith. That what we do with our walk with Christ, it actually matters. It matters. But the good news is to that, that as God calls us to, to put energy into our spiritual growth, he also gives us the promise that it's he who wills and works in our life, that it, it's, it's he who actually comes alongside of us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God's word. It's the, it, it's the encouragement of God's people. It's God himself who is very active in our spiritual growth, okay? And then we got to the second week, and we said, now, one of the DNAs of a Christ follower is that we're pursuing Jesus, that we pursue Christ. We're pursuing an intimate relationship with him that we're jumping in the deep waters with Jesus. We may not know how to swim yet, but we're going to jump in the water. And then the third week, last week, we talked about as Jesus transforms our life and as the gospel transforms our life, we get to a place where we begin to look at our life with a different perspective and we begin to say, I want to steward my life for the sake of Jesus. I want to leverage everything I have for his kingdom, our major commodities, our time, our talent, and our treasure that we begin to see that, that we are stewards of those gifts that God has given us, and we're going to leverage them for the sake of the kingdom. That's the part of a DNA of a Christ follower. We saw that in the very beginning in the early church, and I believe that's the part of the DNA of a local church, a local body of believers. And then today we're going to get to this place where you're going to feel like we just took two steps back, but I'm hoping it propels us five steps forward, okay? So you're going to feel like that we just went backwards, but it's backwards for a purpose. It's for a purpose. And that is that as Christ followers, we have this call or we have this relationship with Jesus that he's actually trying to transform our lives. And 
today's going to be somewhat pretty practical of how do we allow Jesus to transform our lives? How do we truly pursue Jesus? What does that look like? I mean, some of you may be living your spiritual walk right now, and you have your ups and you have your downs, and you think that, you know, I'm kind of in a spiritual drought, but I, I, I want to, I desire to be fervent for Christ. I desire to walk in intimacy with Jesus. I desire to be effective for the sake of the kingdom. I desire to leverage these things, uh, that my commodities in my life, for the sake of Jesus Christ. I, I believe every Christ follower, this is a kind of a strong belief I have. Uh, I think I'm buying what I'm selling. Um, I believe every Christ follower, down deep, has that desire. Like they've been redeemed by Jesus, and they really do desire to live on mission for him, to see the hurdles and the roadblocks of their spiritual growth, to overcome those, and to live in a vibrant relationship with Jesus. I think down deep inside, we all want to experience the fullness of life that Christ has offered us. But many times what we find, as A.W. Tozer said, and I've said it before, that desire without discipline will always breed disappointment. So we have these aspirations to, to live this Christian, Christian walk, but we don't actually put in the disciplines to do it. And so we're always disappointed in our spiritual walk. But here's the thing about discipline. Uh, Don Whitney, in his book, um, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christ Follower, says this, that, that discipline without direction always brings drudgery. And that's true. Like discipline without any sense of direction of what's the result of this, it just seems like drudgery. And so sometimes we give our life to, um, to, to, to maybe, you know, walking with Christ and disciplining our life for the sake of Christ and to knowing Christ but we don't really know the direction, so it seems almost like just religious activity. It's kind of like a pious religious activity that, that just seems like there's not a lot of direction to it. But what we're going to find today is that actually when we discipline our life with purpose and with direction, there's fullness to life. Jesus kind of introduces us to this idea in John chapter 14. And in John chapter, excuse me, John chapter 15. And in John chapter 15, you have to imagine Jesus. Now, I love reading through the Gospels because in the Gospels, we actually get to see the words of Christ. And you say, well, how do you know Jesus really said that? I just say because it's in red. Um, that's how I know. If it's in red, Jesus said it. So I, I like to be able to decipher between Jesus' words and other people's words. But Jesus, is, you know, Jesus in red, he speaks. And, and the thing about Jesus was he was an incredible teacher. You know, everyone knew Jesus as an incredible teacher. But usually the things that he taught were so drastically different than the messages of the world and the messages of the culture. Like the culture would say to hate your enemies, and Jesus says, love your enemies. The culture would say, annoy your neighbors, and he says, love your neighbors. You know, the, the culture would say that don't forgive, but hold grudges, and Jesus would say, no, forgive, right? And so we, we, we know that, that Jesus, the things that he says are always upside down, but yet when he speaks, he speaks with authority, and when he speaks to us through scripture, he, he's giving us insight of, of how do we live as a redeemed follower of Jesus. And he gathers his disciples around. I, I imagine them walking down a dusty road or through town, and, and he, sees a, he sees a house over to the side, and, and on the house is a, is, is a vine that's just kind of crawling up the side of the house. And so he stops, and he says, he says hang on, hang on, guys, I have something to say real quick. And he probably points over to the house, and this is what he says. He says, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So he's talking to his disciples, and he's saying that, that this life that we walk as Christ followers, he's saying, as you live your life as a disciple, like you're not going to be able to bear spiritual fruit without actually abiding in me, without abiding in me. He goes in verse 5, I am the vine, he says, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. So for all the aspirations that we may even have as a church family, all the aspirations that we may have as individuals to be kingdom changers, to, uh, 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 to, to, to live in such a way that has an impact in the watching world around us, if this doesn't come out of a, a, an abiding relationship with Jesus, we're not going to, it's not going to result in spiritual fruit. He goes down in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. And so Jesus is giving us the challenge, even today, he's saying abide in me. It's that idea of pursuing, but maybe even, maybe even beyond pursuing, he's saying abide in me. And the result of abiding in Jesus, it bears fruit. So a Christ follower whose lives have been transformed by the gospel, when we abide in him, the aspirations and the desires that we have to live on mission with him, when we're abiding in him, it actually allows us to do that. It actually kind of pushes us into position to be able to do that. But the Apostle Paul also gives us a reminder that, that in abiding in Jesus and growing in our spiritual growth, it actually takes discipline to do that. It takes discipline to do that. Paul writes to us, in, uh, writes to, the, to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. But listen to this. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promises for the present life and also for the life to come. So Paul's telling young Timothy, Timothy, discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. Discipline, not without direction, that's going to result in drudgery. Discipline yourself for the end result of godliness. For the end result of godliness. For in this godliness, there are promises for you today and for tomorrow. And so he's challenging Timothy. He says, grow up in Christ, mature, abide in Jesus, but discipline yourself to do that. It's like running a marathon. You just don't decide one day to go run a marathon. I mean, you can, but you'll end up like the guy who ran the very first marathon, by the way. If you know the backstory of the marathon, the guy, the guy ran to Maranatha and ended up dying, all right? So you'll die. That's where we get the name Marathon. Like, you have to train yourself for that. You don't just wake up one day and say, yeah, I, I guess I'll just go buy a bike tomorrow and on Saturday, I'll go, I'll go do the hotter than hell race and I'll be fine. Like, you, don't, you can't do that. You have to train yourself for godliness. That's why some of you you get up early in the morning and you go to CrossFit. And what the rest of us don't understand is why you keep picking up that big giant tractor tire and flipping it over. It makes no sense to us. But you're like, I want to be in health, so I train myself for that. And Paul is saying, in the same way, to, to bear spiritual fruit, to abide in Christ, to, to experience godliness, which is, is what God is trying to accomplish in our life. He says to do that, you have to train yourself in godliness. You have to train yourself to do that. Now, this is what we call, um, it, it's a theological word, it's called sanctification. Sanctification is very different than justification, another theological word. Let me give you the two differences so we understand what we're talking about today. All right? Paul is not telling Timothy, train yourself to keep your salvation. Train yourself so that God will love you more. That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what Jesus is saying. Abide in me. That, like, you know, he's saying that it's part of a sanctification a process in which God is very active into bringing us into the likeness of Jesus, in walking like Jesus walked, to bringing godliness into our life. That is sanctification. It's a process. It's that moment that, that you give your life to Jesus. You see, you, you know, for the first time, your heart recognizes what, what Jesus did for you. 
cross and you give your life to Jesus. And from that moment on, Jesus, God is continually working this sanctification process in our life. He's continuing growing us into godliness. Justification is different. It's not about a process. It's your position. It's your position before God. Justification is your position. And your position can never be changed. Once you come into a saving relationship with Jesus, which, by the way, if you're here for the first time and you're trying to figure this all out, that's what we have to offer you first off, is that Jesus, as your Savior, that Jesus died on a cross for you, it was his blood that redeemed you, that all the, uh, all the sin of your life, all, all the working that you're trying to maybe subconsciously do for a God to get to love you, it will never work. It only comes by the merits and the works of Jesus Christ. And so because it comes by the merits and the works of Jesus, when we come into a confession that Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus, I confess that you are Lord and you will be Lord of my life. At that moment, we are justified. Our position before God is solidified. You are now a redeemed child of God, not by your works, by the works of Jesus. And that position can never be changed. It's strong. <laughs> it's unshakable. You, it's your position which God declares you being guilty under sin into being innocent because of the blood of Christ. It's that moment that, that God justifies. It's actually a legal term where he declares that you, were no, that you were dead in your trespasses and your sin. And now I justify you and I change your position to being alive in Christ. That's justification. But in that justification... It pushes us into sanctification, this process of, of learning to live in this relationship with Jesus. And we're called to train ourselves for godliness. One of the ways that we train ourselves for godliness is through what we call spiritual disciplines, through spiritual disciplines. Now, you can read through Scripture, and you can read books on spiritual disciplines, and there's going to be all sorts of different ideas of what a spiritual discipline is. Some would say there's 11. Some would say there's 12. Some would say there's five. There's all sorts of, uh, of understanding of spiritual disciplines. But the reality is, is that spiritual disciplines are critical for our growth in Christ. Spiritual disciplines, if I had to give you a definition, is the practices that we put into our life to experience spiritual growth. It's the practices that we engage in in our life to experience spiritual growth, to be able to abide in Christ, okay? And so these spiritual disciplines are actually really important. And all of us can actually live in spiritual disciplines once we understand spiritual disciplines. So let's get an understanding. What are spiritual disciplines? Number one, I'll say this. Spiritual disciplines are biblical. They're biblical, right? Not only are they biblical, but they are activities that we actually do. It's something that we do. A spiritual discipline is something that we do. It's an activity. It's not an attitude. You know, you don't have the spiritual discipline of joy. You don't have the spiritual discipline of contentment or of thanksgiving. Those are attitudes. A spiritual discipline is an activity that we actually do. And then secondly, it is biblical. It's biblical. When you read through Scripture, it, sometimes it doesn't explicitly say this is a spiritual discipline, but what we learn through Scripture are these are disciplines that God's people had in their life so that they could experience, so that they could experience growth in God, that they experience Christ. And so spiritual disciplines are actually biblical. Some of you do yoga, and you're like, well, that's my spiritual discipline. I don't know. I mean, I don't think Peter was stretching and, you know, and like, let's, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I can't really say that. I guess I could say if when you're doing yoga, you're putting your mind and your affections on the things of Christ, it can be a spiritual experience for you in a Christ-centered way. I, it's not for me. It's just pain. I've tried it, right? But spiritual disciplines are activities that we actually do that are biblical. It's, it's the intake of God's word. It's worship. It's fasting. It's solitude. It's journaling. It's meditation. Some of you are like, meditation? That seems like kind of, isn't that what Buddhists do? Actually, no, meditation is a God thing that the world stole. 
Paul, I mean, uh, David said that I meditate on his word day and night. This is actually part of the activities and behaviors that, 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 that the people of God do. They, they, they look at God's word and they actually meditate on that truth. They think deeply about that truth. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just God using these disciplines in our life to draw us closer to him. So there's all sorts of disciplines, and, and they are biblical. They're biblical. Thirdly, I would say that these disciplines are sufficient for us in knowing and experiencing and growing in Christ. They're sufficient. They're sufficient to moving us along the sanctification process, becoming more like Christ, living and abiding in Christ. They're sufficient for it, sufficient for us knowing Christ more, in experiencing him on a daily basis and growing in my faith. But we have to be warned that spiritual disciplines, number four, are an ends, not are, are a means, not an end. They're just a means, not the end. Right? When I was in high school, when I was a freshman in high school, uh, my youth pastor, who's probably the third most influential man in my life, um, he challenged me to, uh, it, me and a, another group of guys, uh, to to read our Bible every day, to read and journal and pray every day uh, for a whole year. And if we got to the end of the year and we had 365 journal entries in our journals, that he would uh, take us, I grew up in Northern California, that he would take us to Disneyland. We could take a few of our friends and it would be a free trip to Disneyland. So man, I was highly motivated in this. And so I gave myself to the challenge. I read the word, I prayed, I journaled, had a little journal sheet, I filled it out, I had a big giant notebook at the end of the year, I brought it to my youth pastor, and I said, I did it, you know, here it is, and, and we began to look through it, there was 363 days, not 365 days. I was still proud of myself, I said, you know, it's kind of like spirit of the law, you should still give this to me, but he didn't think that way, he said, no, the deal was 365 days, and I was so disappointed, I was frustrated. And then he looked at me and said, Denny, you missed the point. The result of this shouldn't be a trip to Disneyland for you and your friends. The end result of this is spiritual growth. The end result of this is that you begin to know God more deeply. You begin to understand the life that he's called us to. So often, like I did, I gave myself to a legalistic approach to knowing God for the end result of Disneyland. And so I just did it because that's what we do. Check the box, 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 check the box. And it's very possible that we can actually give ourselves to spiritual disciplines and it doesn't actually bring the result that God intends. We may be able to kind of look at that and and, and hold up our spiritual disciplines in some sort of boastful pride of saying, well, you know, I read my Bible every day. Every day I get a little devotional, and on my iPhone I got a little thing here. And you, or I get the verse of the day, text it to me. I don't know. We could actually lift that up and boast about this pious religious activity. Or we can say, I do it because it's about my spiritual growth. It's about the fruit. It's about abiding in Christ. But it does take discipline. That's why Paul says... Train yourself for godliness. We have to train ourselves for godliness. So the practical aspect of this today is we can't go through all the spiritual disciplines. I don't think we have the discipline to go through all the spiritual disciplines today. So we're just going to, I just want to highlight a few. And to do that, I want us to look at what I believe is a biblically functioning church in the book of Acts. What we find in scripture is that God actually gives us a description of what the church of Jesus is supposed to look like. But he doesn't give a prescription of what it looks like, okay? He doesn't prescribe to us, but he does describe to us. And this is what we see in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have this description of what the early church looked like. And in verse 42, it says this, and, I de- and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all and had all things in common. 
And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. This is a description of what the church was like. I think a biblically functioning church, the, doing church the way Jesus intended church to be. It's described right here in Acts chapter 2. Now, there are some characteristics, and, and I'm going to go a little bit on a side tangent on this, so I'm going to come back, don't worry. I won't get too far in the weeds, but I want us to see just a few characteristics of what a biblically functioning church looks like. I think there's nine characteristics that we can find here in Acts chapter 2. First off, a biblically functioning church has leadership. It has leadership. The New Testament would say and begin and describe for us that a biblically functioning church has elders. Here at Colonial Church, we have a group of men that meet the requirement, the biblical requirement that we find in Scripture, that are elders. Their job, their responsibility, their, their, their pain and burden, actually, is to shepherd and to, and to shepherd and to minister to this body, to oversee this body of believers. Any church that's a biblically functioning church has leadership. Now, the Bible doesn't just prescribe for us how many elders you're supposed to have. It doesn't tell us how long they can serve a term. It doesn't tell us how many terms they can, they, they can serve. All it says is it has to have leadership. It has to have elders. And so how many elders should a church like Colonial have? Well, I don't know. I guess however many elders seems sufficient to oversee and shepherd the body of believers, right? And so we see leadership. Any functioning church has leadership. It has elders. It has the word, the teaching of the word. It says that they, that they gave themselves to the leadership, the apostles' teaching. So it, it has to do with the word. It has to do with God's word. It has to do with instruction. So any biblically functioning church should be instructing their people towards godliness, instructing their people in the word. We continue on. It tells us that they had fellowship, that they had all things in common. They fellowship together. A biblically functioning church should have fellowship. It says that they gathered together in the temple courts day by day. Right? They gathered together. So a biblically functioning church actually gathers, doing what we do here now. We're gathering together. It's what we see as, as the template here in Acts chapter 2. We gather together. And in gathering together, we, 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 we teach God's word. We worship. A biblically functioning church should have worship. It says they came and they offered prayer. A biblically functioning church, there should be the characteristic of prayer. It says that they broke bread together. They took communion. A biblically functioning church should take communion. Why do we take communion? Because it, it re-engages our heart of what Jesus did for us. When we break the bread that represents the body of Christ, when we take of the cup that represents the blood that was spilt on our behalf, we remember the things of Jesus, that what he accomplished on our behalf, it stirs our infections for him. But they did that. The interesting part is though they gathered day by day in the temple, they didn't have a big building, you know, they didn't have a building, they all just kind of gathered in the temple courts. It says after this, they went back to each other's homes. Isn't that interesting? Like this whole small group, Bible study, home groups, circles, whatever you want to call it. Oh, it's not some new cool thing churches are doing. <laughs> it was happening in Acts chapter 2. They gathered in large groups, and then they broke down into small groups, into home with people that they were going to share their life with. These are all unique to the body of Christ. These are, these are aspects to, to the body of Christ. And, and evangelism was happening. People were coming day by day into the family of God. Evangelism was taking place. So that's a biblically functioning church. Now, how we're going to jump from that into understanding what this means for us individually today is I want to highlight three disciplines that the early church did collectively and that we know that they did individually 
that allowed them to train themselves for godliness. The first is that of Bible intake. Is knowing God's word. It's a spiritual discipline. That what would it look like here at Colonial if we all gave ourselves to the discipline of knowing God's word? And I don't just mean reading the verse of the day. I mean taking time out of our week to study it, to meditate on it, to memorize it, to apply it. If we did that individually, how would that impact us collectively? We'd be training ourselves for godliness in which Paul says, train ourselves for godliness because there are promises for us today and for tomorrow. So we would actually be experiencing some graces and some blessings from God that we probably wouldn't experience had we not given ourselves to the discipline of Scripture and letting it kind of import into our life in such a way that it brings life transformation. What would it look like if we collect, individually did that and then we collectively did that? So Bible intake, I encourage you, I, challenge, I admonish you. <laughs> you, you. You use admonishment when you want to sound really, really pastoral. I admonish you. Give yourself to God's word. Give yourself to God's word. For some of you, it may just start off with, I'm just going to give myself five minutes a day to read God's word, and that's your first step, and I applaud you for it. I applaud you for it. Some of you may be further along in your spiritual growth, and you say, you know what? Man, I, I, I'm kind of lazy when it comes to God's Word, and I know that I need to discipline myself to really know the Word of God. And so I'm going to study it, you know? I'm going to get me a really good Bible with study notes. I'm going to really get into the depths of Scripture. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to, I'm going to absorb it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to start memorizing a verse a week, whatever it may be. Just start somewhere, right? Just start somewhere. The second characteristic that I think is found in the early church as a spiritual discipline that I believe should be a part of our life, both individually and collectively, is that of prayer. Prayer. You know, we have a conviction. Uh, let me, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to assume. How many of you believe God answers prayer? We believe, as Christ followers, God answers prayer. You may not answer it the way you want it, but he answers prayer. We believe that. And where I get frustrated is when I look at my prayer journal and it's pretty empty. It makes absolutely no sense. It is so incongruent with our faith and our belief. Like we believe God answers prayer, but if we were honest about our prayer life, it's probably not real great. But yet we have a God that says, I can answer it if you just bring your supplications and your prayers to me, cast your anxieties upon me, and I will give you rest. Like, like, come before me. I can actually take care of this. And we believe that, but we are so undisciplined to actually live in that belief. And that's just not individually, that's sometimes collectively as a church. It was Jesus who said, as he cleared out the temple, as he is throwing over the tables of the money changers, he said, and he was, he, 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 was, he was quoting the Old Testament, he said, my father's house shall be called a house of, not a house of really nice sermons to make us feel better, not a house of fantastic children's ministry, though we, we do have a fantastic children's ministry, not a house of, uh, 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 of you know, donuts and coffee out in the cafe, though we have those things, a distinctive mark of God's people is prayer. It's prayer. When, when, when Paul, in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9, when he is converted, Saul, who was ravaging the churches, persecuting the churches, all the, uh, all the Christ followers were on the run because this man was Saul, was, was bringing them under persecution. He comes to Christ, and when he comes to Christ, God, uh, Jesus speaks to a man named Ananias. He says, Ananias, Acts chapter 9, go to Saul. Go to Saul. And Ananias, who's a Christ follower, is like, I I'm not going to Saul. Are you kidding me? He's going to kill me. He has papers to persecute me, to throw me in jail. And Jesus says to him, no, go to Saul, 
for he is a praying man. A distinctive mark of those who follow Jesus is prayer. It's prayer. I do believe the watching world who don't know Jesus are very confused by the people of God and probably confused by my own life. They maybe hear that the people of God are praying people, but they walk into our churches and there's not really an aroma or spirit of prayer. <laughs> they get around my life and they don't see a man of prayer. And they're like, eh, but you believe God answers prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't pray. Well, yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem right. So prayer, what would it look like in our own lives, in our family's life, in our kids' life? If we spent time praying, and then you do that individually, then we come collectively together. Well, what would the spiritual temperature of our church family be like if my father's house became a house of prayer? Then third, I would say worship, the spiritual discipline of worship. What does that look like for you? You say, well, I, I'm here today, I worshiped. What does it look like on Monday? Like, what would it be like if we, we gave ourselves to the discipline and the practice of worship? And for some of you, you throw on Caleb, you turn that bad boy up, Chris Tomlin, you rocking out, and man, you are worshiping, and that's awesome. You know? But how, how, do, we, how do we foster a life and a heart of worship individually? How do you do that? If I could give you a definition of worship, it would be something like this. It would be that it's the attention of our minds aimed by the affections of our heart, authenticated by the allegiance of our life. So it deals with our mind, it deals with our heart, and it deals with actual our life. Worship is not just singing a song. That is worship. That's one aspect of worship. But worship is ultimately authenticated by how we live our life, right? Right? What would it look like if we became worshiping people? Some of you say, man, I, I'm going to start writing poetry about the things of God as an act of worship. How, how would our, our, our spiritual walk just deepen and there'd be depth to it? And we did that individually. Then we came together. We gathered in the temple courts, if you will, as God's people. What would the atmosphere feel like? Now, um, in closing, don't judge me, all right? We're all not, we're non-judgmental place here at Colonial. Uh, I'm going to say that as a value, as if we all believe that, um, so I can tell you the story. So Saturday night, my son and I, we drove to Houston, and um, this was a father and son trip that we planned, uh, I'm not Saturday night, I'm sorry, I was here last night, Friday night. Um, this is a father and son trip that we planned, and we were super excited about it. We, we do lots of stuff. Sometimes it's hunting. Sometimes it's doing different things, and we get excited. This was a real excitement for us because we were going to a concert, and we were going to the concert of my favorite band and my son's favorite band, and this is where the non-judgmental part comes in. So my band and my son, who also loves this band, we went, and we went to the Killers concert, okay? Now, if you know the Killers, all right? So you know who they are. Some of the older folks who may not be, you know, know who the Killers are, you're like, that sounds like a horrible name. This must be like a really bad band. It's really not. They're actually pretty stand-up guys for the most part. But, uh, uh, you know, so we had these tickets. We bought them. We planned it all out. We went to the Killers concert. We got there early, sitting in our seats, you know, and we're just the anticipation, 15,000 people in this arena, you know, just waiting for the Killers to come on. And everybody's excited. Sitting next to me is my 10-year-old. And I have some guy over here who's like 7 foot 5, young adult. I don't know what he does. I didn't really talk to him. Then you have me in my mid-40s. In front of me, uh, I'm being as honest as can be, there was a couple that were probably 65, 66 sitting right in front of me. And I was like, go you. <laughs> Come on. You look around, the crowd is all different, all sorts of people. And just, you know, right before the band comes on, if you've been to a concert, you know it's the same. The lights go out. Music starts pumping. Boom, 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 boom. 
everybody's getting excited, everybody's getting excited. You can kind of feel the rumble in the room. And then all of a sudden, you kind of see the shadows of the band members walking out. You see Brandon Flowers making his way, and the place just erupts, right? And then the lights come on, and they had smoke, and they had fire, and they had graffiti, and you know, I mean, I mean, you know, confetti coming down. It's just like, <laughs> I mean, the place is going nuts, right? My 10-year-old is standing on his chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm screaming. The, the, the you know, stretch over here next to me is screaming. <laughs> the old couple in front of me, they're screaming. And the killers come out, and it's just, I mean, it's on, right? That's for a band. See, sometimes the event... Hear this. The event actually supersedes the way that you and I process life. Well, I'm an, int- I'm an, I'm an introvert. I'm not, I don't get real excited about anything. I'm an engineer. I'm a librarian. I don't know. I'm picking things that I think people are really quiet in their professions. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't process life that way. Yes, you do. When you go to a concert... Maybe for you it's Jimmy Buffett. I don't know who it is. But when you go to a concert or you go to a football game and there's a winning touchdown and it's for your team, you are up and out of your chair because the, what is happening at that moment, it supersedes the way you normally process life. You don't, right? That's not it. Now, where I'm going with this is not like we're about to break out a DJ and boom, boom, boom in here, and, and we're going to, like, everyone start dancing. Like, that's not where we're going with this, okay? All I know is that, is that what would it look like? You know, we listen, to, we listen to, like, every album of the Killers, you know, on the way down. I mean, we were listening to all the different songs. We were getting ready for the moment. What would it look like if throughout the week we were giving ourselves to worship? We, we had a private life of worship that throughout the week, and then when I get to the big event, it's on. It was David, King David, who said that as he danced before the Lord in a linen ephod, which is basically his underwear. And people said, David, what are you doing? He says, and I will be even more undignified than this. Be even more undignified if I could. (laughs) Because for us, it's not the killers, it's not the cowboys, it's not Jimmy Buffett, it's not, you know, I don't know, Trey, that's all I know. (laughs) It is the name of Jesus. That is the event that supersedes the way you and I process life. It just supersedes it. It's the work of Jesus on the cross. It's what he accomplished for you and for me. It supersedes the way I particularly process life. Life, because the event is the wonderful and the beautiful name of Jesus, right? And so what would it look like? What would be declared in this church family if we gave ourselves to going deep with God in his word, relying upon him in prayer, and then declaring his goodness through worship Monday through Saturday, and then we come together and we worship here? Could you experience, could could you just imagine the spiritual vibrancy and the anticipation that God is going to be among us and show up and change my life? and change my neighbor's life, and change my co-worker's life, and Wichita Falls will become a city of God. The event is Jesus Christ. We don't need lights. We don't need smoke. We don't need any of that. The, I, I know the hearts of these people. It is not. They do not want any attention, any accolades. They don't want the clapping. What they want and what I want and what we all want is for everything to go to the throne of Jesus Christ. He's our audience, right? Spiritual disciplines allow us to abide in Christ in such a way that we become fervent, we become vibrant in our spiritual growth. And 
we pursue him individually and we come together and we pursue him collectively and the event is the son of God that's the event and we cling to it we chase towards it and we declare together what a wonderful name it is what a beautiful name it is and for those who are visiting we have nothing to offer you today absolutely nothing but Jesus I mean there's nothing I can offer your life that's going to make it better except for Jesus that's all we got and so if we get excited in here and hands go up and there's hooting and hollering you need to know why it's because Jesus changed our life and he can change yours. So we're going to stand together. We're going to declare the beautiful name of Jesus today. The powerful name of Jesus. He's the event that supersedes the way we process life.
Father, we come before you and we bow before the name that's above all names, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we bow our hearts low because we are humbled by his act on the cross that he redeemed us and brought us into a relationship with you. And Father, we thank you for the promise that you give us, that that you are willing and you're working in our lives. And, And Father, those of us who may just be stumbling along in our spiritual walk, though we desire greatness in our spiritual walk, we know that you're faithful. God, may we chase after your heart consequently chase after the heart of people for the sake of the kingdom. May we walk out of here with boldness, not ashamed, for we are not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation in the name of Jesus. That's all we have to offer is Jesus. So Lord, as we leave here in just a moment, God, may our voices not just stop here, but May we live in the voices with our life and be on mission with you. Just, God, we're we're asking, we're asking that you come and you revive, you breathe fresh air into us so that we can experience the promises that are for today and for tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Always faithful, always good. May we leave here just with the encouragement, with the encouragement that we are children.